to this week's episode of Millennial Mirrors, a discussion on millennial life in the Middle East. Our episode today is going to be about something everyone can relate to, and that is independence, the need for independence, and the backlash that can sometimes result from trying to be independent. Um, now, there are different types of independence, so we're not going to be covering them all. The ones that we're going to be focusing on are emotional independence, i.e. having your happiness and emotional stability not be dependent on the actions and opinions of others, and intellectual independence, the ability to think critically and make decisions for yourself. And there's no better guest for us to talk about this topic with than Zahid Sultan, who's hey, here hey. with me today. <laughs> Um, an all-around artist and social entrepreneur. I'm not even going to begin to kind of try to describe what you do. I'm going to leave that up to you. Um, so, hi, Zaid. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Sounds you, like it's going to be an interesting session today. Fingers crossed. That's on you, though. <laughs> uh, do you want to just tell the audience a bit more about what you do and the, some of the things you're involved in for those of you who don't know about you? Sure. Shame on them, well, though. <laughs> sure. Well, my name is Zahid. Um... I guess, so if I had to simplify, because my mother t- doesn't tend to understand what I do either, so which doesn't help. But yeah, so basically, I like to think that I'm involved in two spaces. One of them is social impact. The other one is arts and culture. Within the social impact space, I started an organization called Envy in Kuwait about a decade ago. And what we basically do is we're an intermediary or incubator for civil society, for NGOs. So what that basically means is we're always looking for grassroots ideas, young people that look to resolve or um, address challenges within society. We invest in them financially, we train them, we create a lot of collaborative opportunities for them, and the end sort of, or big picture is to sort of build out a civil society community where people are more conscientious and aware that they need to be present citizens in order to have a paradigm shift within their society. Um, From an arts and culture music perspective, well, I write, record, perform music, but when I do it in a live context... I always seem to infuse various types of art forms like audio, visual, or video, and dance. Um, And then I take on this, I don't like this word too much, curatorial role. I like the word cultural production better, um, which basically means that, you know, I take a step back and I'm sort of a facilitator where I've created a couple platforms that that allows me to kind of share the artists that I'm inspired by or emerging sort of sounds or, or performances or people from you know, be it from the Arab world, South Asia, or even abroad, and be able to bring them to the region or even showcase them abroad. And, uh, yeah, just kind of create a platform to piece together, you know, sort of things that are, I guess, grassroots as well. Uh, And I think that I've started to realize very closely that everything I do, it all binds together with this idea of community building. Yeah. Amazing. So then from that perspective, what does the word independence mean to you? Heavy question, huh? Right from the get-go. <laughs> okay, independence to me, I mean, it's it's funny. It's funny. Um, so I'm based mostly in London now, yeah? And when people okay. ask me what I do, those that are close to me, my answer mostly is I, I spend my time protecting my freedom so I can relate to the question. Okay. And they look at me they're like, that makes no sense. But what I meant to say is that, you know, so, ma- so many of us, I think a lot about this idea of programming. I think a lot of this idea about sort of conditioning. When I say that, I don't mean like on a computer. I mean that when you're born, for the mm-hmm. moment you're born, your parents, you know, based on their own backgrounds and learnings and societal constructs that they were born into, right. start to pass all of this on to you. Then comes your immediate family circles. In Kuwait, most of us usually have, you know, sort of liberal thinkers and conservative thinkers. Then you go to school and then they impart... You know, you take religion class, you take Arabic, etc. And so yeah. go through this cycle of adolescence where where you're being sort of almost, you know, shaped to be a certain kind of being, right? Right. And then you may wake up one day. You may wake up one day because you may decide, you know, this may suit you and, and you may go down that path and right. and learn that, you know, you, you're a part of these world constructs and that's your purpose. But for those of us that don't fit within these constructs, at least theoretically in our minds, what do you do? Uh, and so for me, going back to your question, independence was first and foremost, how do you deconstruct yourself? How do you deprogram yourself so that you can start to shape your own path, mm-hmm. right? Now, it's there's no such thing entirely as shaping your own path because the world has systems and constructs in place. So right. it's really about how do you navigate those or circumnavigate them to be able to lead a life where um, it sort of serves your own purpose. I don't mean that in a selfish manner. 
mm-hmm. but it's rather about where you can have a space or you can have a fo- um, a path that yeah. allows you to take whatever ideas, whatever outlook you have and translate them into the real world, into whatever form it may be. Makes Very sense. long-winded answer. No, but it makes sense. It's about kind of finding your own authentic purpose and being true to yourself yeah. and what you feel like yeah. you should be kind of yeah. contributing to the world. And I And I talk about this, and I've spoken about this in a previous episode, which is the whole being part of the collective, which right. is so much what we are, our Middle Eastern society is about. I mean, if you in go to theory. the... In, <laughs> in theory, yeah. So if you go to the West, you know, you're kind of like kicked out of the house um, after right. university and you're left to your own devices um, and you kind of figure your own way out. Here in the Middle East, a lot, you know, a lot of it comes from you are always part of the collective. You're always part of First, your immediate family, then your extended family, then society as as a whole. And you always have to kind of factor in all of those things in all your decision making, which doesn't really lead to a lot of, let's say, emotional independence or intellectual independence a lot of the time. So speaking of, I guess, now you're living in London. You graduated from Boston University, right? With business administration? Yeah. And then you moved back to Kuwait. You started working. Yeah, and then you moved. And well, I'll tell you. I'll music. tell you like the brief past ten years. Um, so, going back to this idea of constructs or whatnot, mm-hmm. doing something creative or, or musical was so far fetched in my mind. Even though I come from a creative household, my father um, was uh, an architect. My mother's a landscape designer. My elder brother's a fashion designer. Right. But even um, having said all that, music was so far fetched, especially in the area that we were in Kuwait. Um, and so I thought I need to take that sort of safe path or whatever it is. So I studied business management even when I was in uni and I was very involved sort of with always around music in some form or the other. I never really took that step to, you know, sort of get involved with it, be it scholastically or, you know, even attempt to open up that professional door. Um, moved back to Kuwait, had only a, a single year of doing a formal job for somebody else. Right. Uh, and then um, I went, moved to London and mm-hmm. did a degree in audio engineering moved back to Kuwait, and that's when I started just being entrepreneurial. Mm-hmm. I started first a branding agency, and then I built Envy, which was, or founded Envy, which was the, which is the social impact organization. And all the while, kind of, um, I guess, being an in-the-closet musician, right. uh, till I finally decided to, to, to sort of, you know, publicly release uh, music in 2011. And, yeah, I don't want to go into, from that point to here, what happened. But in a nutshell, it was... That's the process within the sort of a couple of years later started to kick in of, of again, really understanding once I opened this door, which I thought was so far fetched, mm-hmm. it gave me, I guess, um, the, the backbone to, to become a lot more introspective as a person. And that's when I started looking at, you know, these habits I developed and these, what I thought was who I was, et cetera, and deconstructing, reconstructing, which kind of found its place for me, you know. In London, and I didn't have to. I mean, sorry, I'll just mm-hmm. say I want this last thing is that I haven't had even moving to London. I haven't had to make a decision of you know being here or being there. I found this really sort of um, balanced format, being able to be very present in the region while mm-hmm. also sort of you know, I guess starting a new chapter abroad. But I have to tell you though, when I when I did go to London, I did do this program. I was overcome with a lot of it. Like, that first six months were really tough. You know, mm-hmm. I actually developed like if you know what alopecia is, which mm-hmm. is the we call it thalaba, thalaba, yeah, um, which is all stress induced. Yeah. You know, uh, I remember uh, just yeah, just being very anxious, and a lot of it was because I guess now on reflection, it was it was opening that door, right, and right. sort of finding an uncomfortable space, and that was I think the first real. It wasn't the first, but it was one of those I guess you know the first steps I've taken was something that was as has turned out in a long term decision. So what would you say helped you in that situation? And what would you say hindered you? Honestly, it was at that space in time. Uh, it, it was not, there's neither or nor. It was just completely just a leap of faith, you know? Okay. Uh, if you ask me this question, fast forwarding today, uh, I think what I've developed over time is this, <clears throat> is this understanding that, that, uh, that discomfort, finding comfort than discomfort it truly is a path for exponential growth mm. as a human being, as a person. Yeah. And uh, the thing that I've become so weary of is this idea that, again, a lot of what we're, what is communicated to us, be it through film, TV, movie, school, education, parents, friends, environment, is that your your growth or your, your path to happiness mm-hmm. is 
on the outside. It's through the acquisition of things. It's through, through you know, sort of looking at statistical, you know, uh, outcomes in terms of whether you achieved an A or whether you've got X amount of likes on social media or whatever it is. Right. We're actually, a lot of the answers we need are just all inside of inside us. As, as airy-fairy as that sounds, but I really believe in this idea of introspection. And so with that, I found this, this methodology for myself where it, I, when I'm presented with fear, mm-hmm. it's either you can give in to fear or you can decide to say, well, I, and I recognize this is, this is scary, but I also know who I am and I can't give in to fear. Right. And I have to take this on. And also the realization that everything's temporary. So no matter what you get put through in said circumstance, you will prevail. You may not prevail in your original <laughs> mission, but you will you will adapt. You'll get through you, one way or another. Exactly. You'll get to that other side. Now what that will look like is a different story. Right. But you will get there. Yeah. So then let's go back to kind of our societies. What do you think um how do you think independence is viewed or defined in our society at the moment with our generation? I think it's it is a push and pull, right? You, you talked about sort of the U.S. and the West and this focus on individuality, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that here I find it quite interesting because within the, the, the family unit, when you're at home, you're expected to be, right, as p- part of a unit, right. right? You belong to this family that belongs to this tribe and we associate with these values and you're either a progressive or you're a moderate or you're a conservative, etc. Right. But as soon as you step out of that construct, for lack of a better word, yeah. and you start to... Which you know, move into a professional space. Everyone here seems to be like a merchant, and it's about you know succeeding and competing and and being that individual. Mm-hmm. So these they're they're almost to me counter ideologies. But uh, independence here is is challenging because, well, I think it's becoming less and less challenging because to me independence when you're talking about you know, again Western societies for lack of a better reference is that the avenues have all been sort of sculpted yeah. for you to to go down. It doesn't matter what your interest is. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what your background is. If you are um, diligent enough and if you, you know, if you find that community that's going to sort of respond or resonate with whatever your ideology is, yeah. you can probably succeed in some form or the other, right? Right, finding your tribe, yeah. kind of. exactly. In Kuwait, that's a lot harder. So that was a bit complicated. So let's simplify it, right? So if you're someone here who's a sound artist, mm-hmm. right, that basically doesn't want to write music, wants to do sound art, which is very experimental in the art space, where do you go here? What are your platforms? How is there a path for you? Where's your audience, right? Or what if you're someone who is um, a tattoo artist where it's banned by law, right. but like is really moved by that? What do you do here? You know, and so any derivative you find of a path that isn't part of the social norm is going to be very challenging, right? And for the longest time, music was that. Well, non-Khaliji music, right? right? Only recently, when I say this, I mean very recently, is this starting to have... But I'll even take it a step further than that because I think it's not even just about the things that are not, let's say, allowed by society. I think, like you said, you are raised and you're in your family unit and that yeah. family unit and kind of has its own constructs for you. And society has its own, and you're expected, like if your parents are doctors, you're expected to kind of go into that kind of space. Or, And it's one of those things where they, it's kind of built for you from a very young age yeah. what yeah. the expectation is. Right. You have architect, you have doctor, you have join, you know, the oil that's sector. The you have, you know, that's the programming depending on yeah. what your family background is. And so I think it's not even necessarily about what kind of is allowed in society or what avenues are, because I think that takes time. Like even with the music industry with time, it's about the fact that it's deemed unacceptable to go outside of even those avenues that are available. If your immediate circle doesn't kind of allow for it. Great point. Let me build on what you're saying. So I think we're sort of saying the same thing, but I think what we're trying to, I mean, let's think of a regular person, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to approach your family as person X and tell them, I want to, I want to go down a path that's, you know, to them is alien, right? right? So, for better or worse, in Kuwait, if you approach the parent and you you present to them with a path that they don't understand, you don't have reference points to say, "Bas yimma yiba shufu hada." Yeah. Wahad Kuwaiti that's doing this, so they can you know go online or just watch a film or like, ah, oh, okay, yani maqbula. 
you know, yeah. sorry, it's acceptable in society. And that's the issue. And that's something we try to address a lot with my social impact organization is that we always speak about this idea of having role models in society. Road models, road models, role <laughs> models shouldn't necessarily be like, you know, if you, it really gets to me that the primary source of or reference for success in Kuwait is monetary gain. Yeah. Right. And that's pretty standard today. I tell someone, I always use these references. Like I told them I went to Japan for the first time. They're like, so how much did it cost? Right. Like, why is that the first question? Or if you live alone or if you, you know, you're excited about whatever, you finally afforded the first car you wanted. It's not about, well, what was the car? What's the car? You know, and it's they're excited for it. How much did you spend? Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, or if you go on a trip or whatever it is. So that sort of shift in mentality has to happen. Right. And I think it'll only happen the more people carve out these spaces for themselves, right? Right. And I think something that's happened more recently, which I think is quite interesting, is obviously like with the advent of social media, I mean, okay, social media is about 10 years old now, but these sort of Instagrams and more, the more visual um, sort of space of social media is probably like five years old, let's say, right? Right. Give or take. And what's what I've noticed with a lot of people is that if you don't have your community in Kuwait, suddenly now you can have a digital community, right? right? And you feel that you belong to and you develop friendships with them. And I can't tell you the number of people I've met here where I'm in a group and I was like, well, how did you two meet each other? Like, well, we've been friends online for a long time. We met just now, like a year ago in person, you know? Yeah, yeah. So people are building these sort of, yeah, these, um, you know, these virtual relationships that hopefully will at some point converge into the into the real world. And I think that also... If you don't have, you know, permission from family, state, place, whatever, yeah. to be that person, at least you've got a virtual. And I think that's one of the reasons, I mean, that's also one of the reasons why I really feel our generation is kind of feeling this shift and is feeling this conflict more so. I mean, all generations find a conflict with the generation before them. Right. That's something that you can't really escape. But I think with our generation, it's a bit more, I guess, hyper-focused because of the fact that you have all this access to information and right. all this access to social media where you you're not an isolated town or country that gets its news via the local newspaper anymore there is no this Unless is you live in north korea no, which no. apparently is changing to <laughs> when i'm reading in the past there you days. go so like you you are exposed so much to everything that's going on that you're kind of like wait no i can do this you know what right. i mean right don't tell me i can't do this i can do this it's happening over yonder it's as simple it, as you know that, I mean? right it's literally as simple as that yeah anyway go on so i mean no i mean that was pretty much it but i think what let's let's kind of switch it about a bit cuz i think we went very much into career let's switch it into another kind of uh, i guess space about like emotional independence let's start with the basic question of do we live in a society that nurtures the, you know, the development of the emotional self? Mm -hmm. And I, don't, I think that really goes back to the individual and the household they were brought in. You know, for us, we do come from a very, you know, it is a male centric society. And the definition of what an Arab male is, we all know what that is. Yeah. And, uh, for the longest time, I thought, you know, because I moved into music and embraced vulnerability as a person that, oh, everyone is like this. And I started to realize, no, they aren't. Yeah. And it's looked at almost as a weakness to be right. vulnerable, right? So to me, having emotional intelligence or emotional dependence is the willingness, first and foremost, to embrace the fact that you're a subjective being and that you have emotions. And emotions aren't a weakness. They can be a strength. They can serve your purpose when you meet someone that you fall in love with and want to marry and spend the rest of your life with, but it can also serve your purpose. It may not serve your purpose when you're feeling down and out and things aren't going away, but that's still a different face of the same coin or whatever that phrase is. Mm -hmm. um, so, but independence for me from an emotional perspective is about a person's willingness to embrace vulnerabilities and fear in order to go from sort of point A to point B. And again, sort of my own take on this just in general across the board is it takes us as people just this such a long time, you know, to get to a point where we realize that, again, this is completely subjective, but I'm going to say, but <laughs> it's my own personal outlook that your only real responsibility as, as a human being that has a, a finite time on this earth is your own happiness. Right. And if you are able to be happy, then to me that translates into you will be the best person you can to yourself mm -hmm. and the best person you can to those around you, right? But to get to that space 
and to nurture that space is so tough, right? And in order, you know, I hear this so much, you know, like even on TV and movie shows, like, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy, right. you know. But it's like, how can you be happy if you haven't experienced sadness? Right. Right? Because you don't know what one or the other means, you know? Exactly. Because you won't learn to appreciate being happy if you haven't been sad. You won't appreciate that you're being sad unless you realize that there's, there's another side. I think it. also there's the obsession with just being happy all yeah, the time, exactly. which is just it's not like, a feasible thing. Yeah. You know, Unless you're happiness. on Vicodin. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Something. So I think definitely that's one thing that I think a lot of people mistake. I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. There is no such thing as being happy. You yeah, cannot, consistently. That's yeah. a mood. <laughs> okay? yeah. You cannot be in a mood at all times. Life is just a little off Agreed, 100%. For that. I think it's really about this 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 approach you take on a day-to-day basis. That, but that's what it translates down to. You talk about emotional intelligence or just independence is about... This idea of waking up and you are kind of the master of this own vessel that you're going down. Right. Even if it means upsetting your own mother and upsetting your own brothers, not spitefully, right? But rather that you've, you you have this very, you know, you've, you've tuned yourself into a space where you know what your path is. And best example, to make it, to bring it, you know, make it sort of more real. I remember when I first got into music and I, I came from a very liberal family, but I always got... Those around me, they're like, number one is, are you making money? How are you going to survive doing this? And number two was, oh, but are you sure you want to do this even for my own family? Not mm-hmm. in a, we're going to stop you kind of way, but just like, but you've got all these great opportunities. And it was more out of a place of nurture. Mm-hmm. And then you hear in the rape plan, what is he doing? How, like, this doesn't make any sense. And then um, I remember Backlash, and I put out that first video, was a bit comical. And, and you, you get laughed at, and you look at the comments online. Until you get to a space where you keep sort of, you know, sort of pushing through all the noise, and then after you, you you're resilient for a period of time, people may or may not like your music, but they start to respect the fact that you stuck with it all this time. Right. And then when, if you can make it work, and you start to, you know, it starts to find its own aura or space about it, then suddenly a space of fear moves into a space of pride, like for a parent or you know for friends or whatever it is. And I think that. To get from that stage to that stage is, is no matter what your career path is or what your emotional path is, that's the challenging part, right? Right. Um, for example, just one mm-hmm. last point is that so in, in envy, for example, in in our space professionally, failure, failure in Kuwait, right? Failure mm-hmm. is looked at as a negative here, right? Right. It, it's very embarrassing to say that you failed at something, right? So we had this, you know, we adopted a, you know, an exercise abroad or an activity or event which we do sort of seasonally call a fail fest okay. where we invite all these young NGOs and people to sit in like you know like a, a, a circular like in a circle mm-hmm. and all we do is sit and talk about things we failed at amazing you know to celebrate that and have an open space to share that something very simple stupid to the point but it's this idea that like you can't win all the time i.e. you can't be happy all the time right. you know yeah so I mean there's two things that you kind of said which I want to I guess talk about yeah one would be the fact that you know the conversation with the family and i think that's something that a lot of people don't bother to have it's a they start the conversation things get uncomfortable and then it's just okay let's just end it and yeah one of us is going to compromise just to end this conversation and i think having a conversation with your parents or your family or whoever it is about what really matters to you and what you value kind of allows you to under, have a better understanding of where the other person is coming from rather than talking about it from, let's say, a rules and regulations Fair of enough, our society yeah. perspective. Yeah. If you kind of go at it from, uh, I, you know, creativity is very important to me. Um, creation, you know, like independence is very important to me. So working, for example, on nine to five is not necessarily a place that I want to be. And then you, they can be like, okay, well, we care about your future and your, you know, stability. Right, and, right. and you kind of come at it from here's what we care about here's what's important to us let's see how we can meet in the middle versus this is what i want to do well this is what you you can do and it just ends up being a clash where everyone kind of resents everyone else the other thing which i just that you kind of talked about was the whole you know you had at the end of the day your family and i think that's one of the things where i feel people use being part of a family and being part of a social construct as an excuse not to do something rather as seeing it as a security net that if you fail you have something to fall back into you know what i mean like as as much as i say okay i decided to go and get a job and i decided to do my own thing i was able to go into work and kind of 
take risks and take chances and do things that I normally wouldn't be able to do. Because I knew at the end of the day, push comes to shove. If something goes wrong, I have a family that's got my back. I have friends. I am part of this big collective. So I think if you look, if you flip it on its head a bit and look at it as a source of strength rather than as a source of weakness, Mm. you know what I mean? As an excuse, it could be something that really helps kind of propel you rather than hold you back. But you need to kind of have that shift in perspective. Right. I think the key, the key uh, sort of, I don't know, I've noticed that what, what you said, basically the key, not takeaway, but what's most important to a parent is the stability of the child. Or for them, it's really about, well, how are you going to survive financially, right? Mm-hmm. So I've noticed even my own sort of uh, scenario going, thinking back, is that if you can prove to someone that you can be financially you know, sufficient mm-hmm. without having to rely on them, then they don't have the power they can exercise on you to say, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that, because you've proved them otherwise. Right. And that makes them kind of stand back and be like, you know, maybe I got this wrong. Or if it's that social media person that, you know, suddenly gone, you know, hundreds of thousands of fans and is getting, you know, interest from companies to come do all the, then suddenly a parent has to, like, shift their mindset because the general populace has, like, responded has shifted, to right. whatever the path you've taken, Right from what I've seen mm-hmm. right so I think it's it's really a sort of on a case by case basis so takeaway is make sure you can be financially independent to do it now building on that this mm-hmm. idea of you know having uh, um, this safety net I personally would like to disagree with you okay when it comes to the point of knowing you have a safety net because when you know you have a safety net I don't believe that it allows you to take your risks. It, it, you almost it hinders you in my idea, in my mm-hmm. eyes, in a way. If you know that it's this or nothing, it's all in or nothing. Right. Suddenly, like you, again, in theory, you you have to expand your horizon. You have to look at it from a very sort of um, holistic manner. Like to sort of simplify it, it's about you know all of us have to develop. I believe, like a methodology for how we approach our life, right? Mm -hmm. Now, be it through the kind of friendships you want to maintain, how you want to address, you know, being a part of family unit Mm -hmm. or the kind of professional you want to be, right? And the sooner we figure that out, the more learned we are and the more sort of balanced we are as people. But in order to do that, there has to be an appetite for risk. If you don't have an appetite for risk and you're risk averse, you'll just kind of, you know, float on by and unfortunately what happens in Kuwait is because there's so many cushions around us it's very conducive to not have to actually go out there and exactly and put yourself out there so let's to let if you had to give one tip to a fresh grad coming out of university now who wants Oof. to kind of break out and do their own thing that's let's say not acceptable either within um their immediate family or in society if they want to be a tattoo artist okay let's say a tattoo artist because that's illegal let's not assume well, not actually, so, <laughs> let's not assume someone around the other day who knows a tattoo artist in Kuwait I was like uh, okay um, but yeah I mean if you're if you're if you're going to give advice to I guess the gener- the younger generation that's coming out now what would you give them in? I think they're giving us advice let's be honest about <laughs> that's it. a valid point yeah. like, um, why didn't I think of that yeah. god damn it when I was um I remember that the sort of the things that I would tell, you know, friends of mine who, you know, who were wanted to go into starting a business or just be independent is that build up an appetite for risk. Because all of us when we were younger were a lot more fearless, mm-hmm. right? And so, and also when younger, like you have a lot less to lose, not in the real world, just in your mind and in your heart. And just what happens, unfortunately, and organically over time is, you become a lot more aware of your surroundings. You become a lot more aware of what your role is as a person within a society, within a bit, within a family. You know, to your brothers, to your mother, to whatever it is, mm-hmm. and you—that's what growth is. Right. And with that comes this: you start to become shaped more, and you start to have less of an inclination to take on fear, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because you want to know what's on the other side, which right. is. Obviously, if you, you won't take on risk if you're trying to figure if you want to know what's on the other side. So it's really about if you build up this appetite. I mean, I say risk, but it's really about if you're presented with fear, not to give in to fear, but rather overcome those fears or look at those fears as um, as uh, 
not as a hindrance, but rather as fuel. You know, there's a really good yeah. TED talk if you search on stress. And this, the talk basically is about the idea that we perceive stress as a hindrance and a handicap. But actually, if we start to turn stress on its head and look at it as something that propels us, mm -hmm. then it'll have, you'll have an entire sort of shift in perception and you can use it to your advantage. If you have that capacity, like I looked at it as like, what's the worst that's going to happen? And you're right. Yeah. Actually, now that I'm speaking out loud, I was like, what's the worst that's going to happen? I'm going to pack my bags and I'm going to come home, you know, to, you something I, to a place <laughs> that I know. So yeah. maybe I retract my words and what you said was right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, thank you, Zaid, for joining me here today on this episode. It's been great having sure. you. And Pleasure. I know you you have like a super busy week, so I really appreciate <laughs> no, you taking the time. Good. I mean, uh, you flew in for this, so, you know, you trumped me. <laughs> so That's true. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, where should people go to find uh, find out more about you online? Um, I mean, the page, as funny as this is, that's the most up-to-date is there's a wiki page. Um, but a lot of sort of my own, again, this is just tactically done. So uh, if you're interested in finding out my own work, it's zahatsultan.com. If you're interested in finding out sort of the, the work we do in social impact, it's envearth.com. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, or wherever you're listening to this. We will be releasing a new episode every week. Also, please leave a comment. Let me know what you think if you have any questions or if there are any subjects or topics that you think we should cover. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Mishari Alanazi. Links are in the episode description. Bye, guys, and stay safe. Stay safe.